I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you updates from the front lines as Russia bombards Odessa, analyze the arrival of the Wagner Group into Belarus, and we speak to Dr. Sasha Dovshik live from Kiev about her work in the country and what it's like returning. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Monday, the 24th of July one year and 150 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by foreign correspondent James Kilner, Brussels correspondent Joe Barnes, and our guest is Special Projects Curator and Associate at the Ukrainian Institute and lecturer in Ukrainian at the UCL School of Slavonic and East European Studies, Dr. Sasha Dovshik. I started by asking James for the latest news from Ukraine. Hi, David. Good to be with you again. So, yeah, I've been on the Moscow desk for a couple of weeks now, and um, that included over the last weekend. And one of the big stories was yesterday was this missile damage to the main cathedral in Odessa. So Odessa has been hit now, I think, for every night since last Monday when um, Kremlin pulled out of a deal that allowed uh, Ukraine to export grain. The deal had been negotiated a year earlier by the UN, and it had been relatively successful in, in, in letting Ukraine get its grain out. The deal was that Russia would, in, would, would Russian forces would be able to uh, inspect ships before they landed in Ukrainian ports, and then pick up grain, and then and then allow them to export, etc. They pulled out last Monday, and since then, Odessa has been hit several times by, uh, or every night, by, by missiles and drone attacks. And that included on Sunday, uh, Saturday night, Sunday morning, when it seems that a missile, so there were no, we know there was 19 missiles fired at Odessa on, on, on Saturday night, Sunday morning, which is an awful lot, obviously. Nine of them were shot down by Ukrainian air defense systems. And it's likely that one of these that was shot down landed on the main cathedral, if it had been deliberately targeted, uh, the damage would have well, there'd be nothing left of the of of, of the cathedral. Uh, there is substantial damage. The roofs had collapsed, cracks in the walls. There was fires. It looked a complete mess. But 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 anyway, so we have this very visually impactful full, um, damage to the cathedral and the surrounding centre of Odessa, the historic Tsarist um, era buildings. Lots of them were had their roofs blown off, their cars destroyed rubble all over the place, um, and then wider out, the uh, the Soviet-era bomb blocks also had their balconies and windows blown in, etc. There's one, at least one person killed, 22 people injured. So Russia always claims that it hits military targets. Obviously, it hit a civilian target in this place, a, a cathedral, and it, we know also that it's been it's been tog- deliberately targeting these these grain silos and other port infrastructure. Death is the biggest um, port in Ukraine. And today, again, this morning, again, there was more drone attacks on Odessa, more grain infrastructure was destroyed. And also further west, uh, this is important, further west along the, around the Danube Delta, which Ukraine has been developing as a, an alternative route to export grain. Um, there, was, there was another drone attack and it also hit uh, port facilities. So it's clear that the Kremlin wants to damage Ukraine's grain export capacity, its ability to to to, to function as a as a primary grain exporter. This may be because Putin is hosting leaders from Africa later this week. Now, Africa is particularly reliant on grain to feed its populations. And one of the reasons that Putin agreed to the grain deal, the uh, UN negotiated grain deal initially a year ago, is because he's trying to woo Africa and African leaders. He's run out of a lot of allies around the world for obvious reasons, but he sees Africa as, as potentially more sympathetic to the way he sees sees everything. And more or less, that that, that has been the case. We, we, the Wagner Group that operates in, in Africa, 
the South Africans have, uh, were prepared to host Putin until the International uh, Criminal Arrest Warrant was slapped on him. They were prepared to host him at a major summit next month. So it looks to to analysts and, and to me and, and other journalists that the Kremlin is deliberately trying to destroy Odessa, port facilities, its grain storage facilities, etc., ahead of potentially trying to renegotiate the, the grain deal or come to an agreement later this week, Thursday and Friday, the African leaders are in, in, in Russia uh, with Africa to, to, to boot its own grain sales to African countries. So when, when, when we look at the Odessa and missile and drone attacks, and they're, they're all terrible and, and lots of people are suffering, there, there's a wider context as well within the, within the war in Ukraine, and that is the Kremlin sees the grain export deal and Odessa's place in Ukraine's export system as a vulnerable target. Thank you very much, James. Can I go to Joe Barnes? You've been looking at some of the uh, other news coming in from Ukraine and Russia. Where would you like to start, Joe? I'm going to just speak through what appeared to be a drone attack on Moscow in the early hours of Monday morning. So that's today, July the 24th. So Russia said it had prevented a Ukrainian terrorist act on the Russian capital as two drones hit uh, non-residential buildings. Um, one of the drones, so fragments of this drone, uh, one of these drones was said to have been found near the Ministry of Defence. Lots of operational secrecy, sort of like she said, he said, antics as always uh, with these things. So Kiev, as it always does, has remained operationally and officially silent on strikes deep behind enemy lines within Russia. But this morning, CNN, the American outlet broadcaster, has reported and citing sources within Ukrainian military intelligence that Kyiv was indeed behind the strike. But as I mentioned, there is no official attribution or recognition for this strike. Uh, but let, let's talk through it a little bit. Uh, so the alleged attack happened in the early hours of Monday morning, and it comes after Kyiv vowed to retaliate for a Russian missile strike on the port of of Odessa. And then the Russian Defense Ministry issued this statement, and I quote, a Kyiv regime attempt to carry out a terrorist attack using two drones on objects on the territory of the city of Moscow was stopped. Two Ukrainian drones were suppressed and crashed. There were no casualties. Uh, what we do know, according to Russian media, was a man has been arrested in Moscow after the alleged attack. The 41-year-old was caught at the time filming the Ministry of Defence building, where one of the drones crashed nearby, at around 4 a.m. And that's according to Baza, a telegram channel, a Russian telegram channel, which has, uh, like many of these sources, apparent close links to Russian security services. He has been named as Dmitry B and is being detained for further proceedings. Uh, and that's in quotation marks. So what we know and what we've seen of this We've seen posted around social media. It was first posted via Russian sources, as you can imagine, with any sort of incident inside Moscow, is short videos of the top of these high-rise buildings and the windows on the top floors have been blown out and the, the damage to its main structure, but the buildings are largely intact. So other Russian telegram channels, uh, which also have sort of links to the Russian security services, published videos of the glass and concrete debris on the floor of what appeared to be, and I'm sure James can correct me when it comes around to him again, Komsomolsky Avenue. And so traffic was also closed on that road, as well as Likashev Avenue in Moscow South. And then let's flick back to Ukraine and the counteroffensive, where Ukraine is said to have captured more than six square miles from Russian forces in the south and east of the country, over the last week. So Deputy Defence Minister Hannah Malia, who is the sort of the spokeswoman, and she's often the one coming out on the airwaves and speaking about the counteroffensive, she has said, during the week, liberated areas in the south increased by 12.6 kilometres square, let's say 4.9 miles. 
She added that Kyiv's forces had seized another four square kilometers, 1.5 miles, near the embattled city of Bakhmut in the east. Russian forces have reportedly conducted assaults in the Kupiansk area of the eastern Kharkiv region. And you, you have um, remembered back from last week when I spoke through James's report on Russia is apparently building and putting together a force of up to 100,000 soldiers in that region. And so Hannah Mailer says that this is with the aim of pushing Ukrainian units beyond the Oskil River. We've also had, as well as this apparent Russian drone attack in Moscow, we have had what appear to be Ukrainian strikes on occupied Crimea. So a Ukrainian drone attack on the occupied peninsula was said to have been foiled without any casualties, according to Russia's defence ministry. It said 17 Ukrainian drones were sent at the region last night, and it claimed that 11 of them crashed into the Black Sea. Three of them fell on Crimea, and three of them were destroyed by Russian air defences. So, look, we can't independently verify that, um, as... I mentioned previously, Ukraine is tight-lipped on these things, and can we trust the Russians? Not particularly. But what we do gather from social media reports and official statements is that one of them landed on a ammunition dump in the area. And so this ammunition dump in the Denzenkoi region of Crimea, and the concern was enough that villages in a five-kilometre radius of the blast zone were evacuated. So we, we could guess that they are fairly substantial ammunition stockpiles that are being targeted there. We know Ukraine favours this approach of trying to hit deep behind Russian lines where its logistics hubs, its command and control posts are kept in, basically, in order to disrupt the occupation of Russia in southern Ukraine. Uh, the region's railway and highways linking its, it with Simimpropol were also closed. So that's uh, we can we can guess from that that there was fairly sizable destruction. Um, and then we will report to sort of heavy shelling elsewhere. So um, massive shelling was reported to be taking place in the Donetsk region with houses and shops damaged by Russian attacks, according to the regional governor. Uh, he wrote on Telegram, Avdivka was subjected to massive artillery shelling. Shells hit residential quarters. Three houses, a shop, and two administrative buildings were damaged on the Holivsky direction in Toetsk. Two houses were damaged in Shashovoyarsk. Four houses were damaged in Lysyshansk in the direction of Siversk. There is no current information about the number of people who were wounded or killed in the attacks that's Pavlo Krialenko, the governor of that region. Thank you very much, Joe. Before we go to Sasha, we'll bring you both back uh, briefly. James, you've been looking at Wagner and uh, Wagner's uh, arrival in Belarus and Lukashenko's um, also arrival in Russia to see Vladimir Putin. Um, can you tell us about this story? What's been happening? I think this is an important story to monitor. So we've got um, an unknown number of Wagner fighters have now turned up in in Belarus from Russia in, in various convoys. We know this because a uh, Belarusian NGO tracks this sort of stuff very carefully. Now, they're basically heading towards one camp in the centre of the country. We think there's uh, maybe somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500, 2,000 there at the moment. Uh, a, a senior Wagner commander said that this may rise up to 10,000. So uh, a, a sizable number. And we've also got uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, uh, the Wagner leader, popped up in uh, at, at this camp on Wednesday morning. There was a very shaky mobile phone video of him addressing his fighters. So we know that they are beginning to establish themselves. The, the, the Belarusian Ministry of Defense have said they have a roadmap with Wagner to benefit from their experience, they, as they like to put it. And also Wagner uh, fighters have been have started a... I can't remember how long it was, a week-long or two-week-long training session with Belarusian Special Forces at a Belarusian defence area near Brest, which is on the border with Poland. Now, this has obviously triggered a lot of alarm bells in Poland who have moved over 
at least a thousand soldiers onto their border. And Lithuania has also asked NATO for extra help uh, in strengthening their borders. And in Ukraine, Zelensky has ordered uh, increased surveillance along their borders. The issue here is you've got an army who are used to fighting, uh, they're battle-hardened, they haven't got much, seemingly much else to do other than train better Russian soldiers at the moment, which, which is kind of below their level of intensity, they're below what, you know, their level of experience. So the issue is, what, what are they going to get up to? Uh, we know that Wagner fighters are not going to be deployed to Ukraine Again, in the near future, Prigozhin said this uh, himself on on Wednesday morning during his address to his uh, his fighters, and and Putin is is also very unlikely to trust them in Ukraine again after their um, rebellion at the end of June. We do know that they're going to continue operations in Africa, uh, which is a major source of their income. So I'd expect some to 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 get sent off to Africa. But the the, the Africa their operations in Africa go far beyond just mercenary style fighting or bodyguarding it's also sort of um uh, political gerrymandering um uh, you know a, a a b c on how to be an autocrat and get away with it this sort of thing how to be a dictator and get away with it massaging uh, pr campaigns etc uh, etc et so it's 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 less uh, the africa stuff is it requires less fighters than sort of other operators. And this means the bulk of those fighters who turn up in Belarus are probably likely to stay there. And this is, as I said, causing headache in, on the, on, in, in the EU. Now, on, I think it was Friday, I can't remember exactly, Putin said that he would consider an attack on Belarus as an attack on Russia. Strange statement to put out in many ways because I don't think um, anyone's considering an attack on, on on Belarus. He named Poland as as wanting to grab territory from Ukraine and Belarus to move its borders back to where it was pre World War II. Uh, he said he has said this previously. Now, what analysts and 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 politicians are worried about is that he's setting the stage up for some sort of false flag attack, which would allow him to retaliate and attack Poland or, or, or another neighbouring country to, to Belarus. Uh, that's what people are very worried about when he starts talking in, in this sort of language. Um, and then on Sunday, yesterday, Lukashenko came to St. Petersburg to meet um, Putin. They had a segment to the cameras after their meeting in which Lukashenko said that he is struggling to restrain Wagner fighters who want to march on Warsaw. Now, this sort of language has been going on all week uh, on the fringes in the Wagner telegram channels. They've been goading Poland, uh, saying that they're more scared of Wagner fighters than they are of uh, Russia's nuclear weapons. They've been promising to have lunch in Warsaw, all this sort of stuff. And now you've got it from uh, Lukashenko. He's basically confirming and obviously, we don't know if it's tongue in cheek or trolling or just making stuff up or goading, or if he's serious in any way. He's he's saying that he is the restraint on Wagner from um, attacking Poland. It's difficult to imagine Lukashenko acting as that sort of restraint. We do know he did play a role. He claims it was a very big role. Other people have said it was a much smaller role in mediating an end to the Wagner rebellion on June the 24th. Um, and he's obviously taken in a lot of uh, uh, Wagner soldiers into Belarus. So he is in many ways their patron. Whether they really have designs on Poland or Lithuania or any other country, it's very difficult to say. But these, this sort of language by Lukashenko, by Putin, really raises the tension on the EU-Belarus border. Thank you very much, James. Just to Joe for one more section before we go to Sasha. Um, Joe, we've been reading, um, according to US reports, that the US is holding firm against sending long-range missiles to Ukraine. Can you tell us about this? The UK has donated uh, Storm Shadow air launch cruise missiles. The French have donated what is essentially the same missiles as Storm Shadow, but goes by their name, the French name of Scout. But what are the other sort of great militaries that have been donating hardware en masse to Ukraine is the United States, and they don't seem to be willing to send their long-range missiles. And the, the one missile that has been pegged, and we've long talked about it, at the top of 
Volodymyr Zelensky's shopping list has been the Army Tactical Missile System, the ATACM. And I would think it's fair to say uh, the US are holding firm against sending this type of long-range missile to Ukraine. In May, we thought that was slightly softening. Uh, so Joe Biden said that they were still in play. When the, the fast forward to the NATO summit in Vilnius uh, recently at the beginning of this month, about two weeks ago now, Zelensky and Biden had a conversation about these missiles. And again, we thought potentially that would be a moment where Joe Biden could unlock his donations. Zelensky could basically urge him to move forward with those. But it, it doesn't seem to be moving forward that quickly. So according to the Washington Post, the policy of not sending these missiles is likely to remain in place despite public perception that there had been, and I quote, gravitational pull towards approving them. So to talk through uh, a bit about these missiles, they have a top range of around 190 miles. They are launched from the HIMARS uh, rocket launcher system. So that would give Ukraine's armed forces another dimension. So the, the Storm Shadow, the Scout, uh, donated by Britain and France, they're launched from aircraft. So air launched. But the uh, Attackums, which have a slightly longer range, um, about, about 50 miles more than the Storm Shadow and Scalps are launched from the ground um, with similar precision, but it just gives Ukraine's military another dimension to attack. So Andre Yermak, uh, who is uh, Mr. Zelensky's uh, chief of staff, essentially, he has been saying that these missiles, the attackums, are on the top of Ukraine's shopping list and they have all for hundreds of, hundreds of these things. They really think that they can use them to sort of decimate, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, Russian command and control posts, uh, logistics hubs, ammunition dumps, troop centers uh, and barracks and the stuff deep behind enemy lines. And that would further push Russia back from the front lines, which then makes it easier for Ukraine to push forward. That's the idea anyway. So Kiev isn't without support in Washington. Um, so Michael McCall, the chairman of the House of Representatives, the chairman of the House of Representatives said there's no reason not to give Ukraine just enough to bleed, but not enough to win. Advocates for attack of deliveries also hope that the US position will evolve in a similar fashion to its basically agreement to supply, or well not supply, but allow European allies of Kyiv to supply F-16 jets. Earlier this year, Biden's administration refused outright to authorize Western allies to basically allow training on these jets, but with a little push and a nudge, uh, Britain's donations of storm shadows were attributed to helping this process along. Joe Biden's eventually said, look, you can train and eventually equip Ukraine with F-16s. What I think is interesting is, and it says a lot about Joe Biden's approach. Yes, he has funneled in sort of tens of billions of dollars worth of equipment to Ukraine, but he is often reticent to go that step further in arming Ukraine with something that can be seen as escalatory in the eyes of Moscow. Yes, look, the, the Attackums are sort of a great piece of kit and it gives Ukraine that extra dimension that I was talking about. Sure, Kyiv would, would probably reach some agreement with America where it says it wouldn't use its target mainland Russia. Would it go as far as saying Crimea? Maybe not, and that's probably what the Americans are worried about. And it's probably just that step that the Americans are particularly just worried about escalation. They don't want to basically goad Russia into some sort of situation where Vladimir Putin decides, look, let's escalate this conflict. Does he attack a NATO ally and test the alliance's Article 5 neutral defence clause? Does he potentially use a chemical weapon, a nuclear weapon, or even sort of a nuclear provocation in Zaporizhia, does he do something that would then force America's hand to do something that it doesn't want? And we know that the Americans aren't particularly fond of allowing Vladimir Putin to test the Article 5 uh, process, and that is essentially why Ukraine was not offered a timeline or a given a actual genuine road kind of pathway into NATO because of sort of US hesitance. And I, and I think that is uh, still moving with attackums, and that is 
something that I don't think we're going to see for a while. Talk will always be sort of out there because, it, well, it's top of the Ukrainian shopping list when it's uh, coming to Western donations. But I just don't see a point at which Joe Biden is going to move away from this stance, especially when the likes of Britain and France have already donated similar capabilities, 150, kilo, 150 miles rather than sort of 190. Well, thank you very much, James Kilner and Joe Barnes, for your contributions there. And um, we'll come back to you later at the end if there are any further updates you'd like to talk through. But it's a great pleasure to welcome our guest, Dr. Sasha Dovshik. Sasha, you've been on the podcast before. It's really good to hear you again. Thank you so much for making time for us. Uh, you're in Ukraine at the moment. Um, what have you been doing out there the last few weeks? And what have you heard and seen that you think the listener, listeners should know and understand? Hi, David. It's fantastic to be on Ukraine The Latest yet again. Uh, I'm indeed in Kyiv now. Um, and I have been here for almost a month. Uh, have been involved in a couple of projects, in three projects actually. Uh, one was collecting testimonies of uh, Ukrainian cultural workers who have been killed by Russia's war. So as you know very well, Russia um, wages a war against Ukrainian culture by obliterating cultural centers such as Odessa, uh, and also by physically removing murdering Ukrainian writers, artists, um, musicians, um, sound engineers, and so on. Um, so what we are trying to do is to make sure that uh, their legacy and their light and their work outlives this terrible genocidal war because the resilience of our culture is uh, one of the proofs that uh, Ukraine can and will win in this terrible war. So from um, our dear friend and colleague, you actually talked about uh, Ukrainian writer Victoria Amelina, whom we buried in Lviv on the 5th of July, who was killed by Russian missile strike on Kramatorsk. To people like a historian and uh, restoration artist and archivist from the um, National Museum of Cossack History in Zaporizhia, my native, my hometown, uh, Vyacheslav Zaitsev. I talk to relatives, friends, close people of these uh, fantastic and sadly uh, killed uh, artists, writers, and so on. And I um, formed the groundwork for future essays, uh, which I hope will be a series of uh, uh, online publications and will, will later become a book eventually. Apart from that, I'm uh, very passionate, as you know, about uh, helping foreign journalists cover the war. So I work as a local producer for um, foreign media outlets. And um, it's, it's really interesting and uh, useful to try and do your best to counter Russian propaganda narratives, which seep in despite our best intentions into our discourse. So... For example, almost like a year and a half into this terrible war, there is still some doubt in the West about Ukrainian far-right problems, so to speak. Um, and I, um, other than just you know trying to um, address this issue, this this uh, problem invented by Russian disinformation campaigns, um, I suggest uh, the journalists I work with to actually go to people who should be <laughs> affected by the Ukrainian far-right extremism in the first place. So we went and talked to the chief rabbi of Ukraine, uh, Masha Azman, um, who uh, would be the, the authority on Ukrainian um, nationalism or Ukrainian anti-Semitism. And the thing that uh, the chief rabbi of Ukraine uh, was able to tell us was that the main problem, problem of the Jewish people in Ukraine, as well as of all other uh, groups, is uh, um, actually Russia's genocide of uh, everyone who is connected to, the, to Ukraine as a country, as a culture, um, as a nation, as a political nation. So um, Jews in Ukraine do not actually face anti-Semitism. Uh, inside Ukraine, uh, but they do face Russian missile strikes, as we all know, unfortunately. Um, and the third uh, project I'm uh, continuing is my remote work for my uh, uh, fantastic institution, the Ukrainian Institute London, where I'm a 
a curator um, of special projects. And one of those projects is uh, an online course in Ukrainian literature and culture called Literatura. So last uh, this week, uh, last week, actually, it was uh, the last of our sessions. Uh, it's an eight week course that tries to introduce uh, our learners from all over the world to Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainian people through literature to give the, them this literary perspective on our history and our our struggle actually. So it's uh, it's very uh, rewarding to be involved in in these projects and to be at intersection of all these trajectories. Sasha, could we talk about the strikes on Odessa? Um, what are you hearing from people around you in, in Kyiv? This has been going on for days, and of course, as James described earlier, um, the cathedral was incredibly badly damaged. What are you hearing from people in the, in the cultural sphere? Uh, yeah, it's devastating, actually. I don't know what else can we say. There, um, we constantly check in on uh, our friends and colleagues who are in the south of Ukraine, in Odessa, or in Odessa region to make sure they survive this. But to see Russia target a city which uh, has been so instrumental for Russian imperial mythology as is is <laughs> quite eye-opening. Uh, as you know, Russians claim that they have founded Odessa, that their um, uh, Empress uh, Catherine II was the founder of the city and so on and so forth. And it is interwoven with uh, Russian cultural and uh, military and political history, this southern Ukrainian jewel. Um, but to see them target the cultural center, including the Russian Orthodox Church, which is protected by UNESCO, the, the level of protections we can discuss, and I'm being sarcastic here, obviously, um, is, is very revealing. It means that they have realized they cannot control Odessa, that Odessa will never be theirs, it will never be Russian. So as uh, with all other Ukrainian cities, towns, ideas... Uh, when Russians see that they can't have them, they obliterate them. They do their best to uh, just wipe them off the map of the earth. And uh, I believe this is what is happening in Odessa. We saw a tweet from you, uh, I believe last week, teaching your literature course from a metro station during an air raid. Can you tell us about that? Um, I mean, talk us through what happened in, in, the, in, those, in those hours. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, it's not a singular occurrence because uh, air raids and air raid alerts have been uh, constant uh, a few weeks ago. It started with a um, strike on Lviv where I was at that moment and I was just two kilometers away from, from, from the uh, epicenter of a uh, Russian strike. And it continued in Kiev with um, Shahed drone attacks and with uh, the threat of Russian missile attacks on the city. So, and there is, uh, um, a, a, there are various tactics for us to address various Russian uh, threats from the air. So uh, at this point of the war, we are being informed by Ukrainian air defense about what kind of threat this actually is. Uh, if it's a Shahid drone, then probably, uh, and I'd, uh, Treat this with caution. This is probably just me and my ways of navigating this space. So if it's a Shahid drone, then uh, you might choose to sit the air load out in the bathroom or in the corridors, putting two walls behind yourself and the outside space. And if it's something more serious, like cruise missiles or uh, it's a bomber, uh, then actually it makes total sense to go to a metro station, which is a great shelter for all of us in, in those cities in Ukraine where there is metro. And and these uh, metro bomb shelter situations are actually quite endearing. Uh, in Kiev, for example, um, you will be looked after by these elder Ukrainian women who work in these metro stations. They, they suddenly turn into these motherly figures who will look after you, take care of you, provide you with a chair to sit on and uh, make sure you you are in a good mental space. Uh, and it, it has been actually quite dear to me to speak to these ladies. Um, yeah, and uh, during one of those uh, air raid alerts, uh, I realized that uh, my lecture uh, might take 
place in one of those shelters, but I was lucky enough that the air raid alert uh, was cancelled. It was over just 10 minutes before my lecture was due to start, and I rushed off home and was able to run it from the comfort of my desk and chair. Sasha, in going back to Ukraine from the UK, is there anything that's different to how you might have expected it or or sort of changed your perception on the country? It's a very good question. Um, I think that I'm being constantly surprised by the levels of resistance in Ukrainian society. Like uh, Ukrainian writers and human rights defenders turn into these full-time volunteers who run uh, pickup trucks and all kinds of aid to the front line. And a uh, Ukrainian uh, theater maker, a friend of mine, first um, trained as a paramedic and now retrained as a sniper, um, a fantastic Ukrainian veteran who had a double amputation as a result um, of a Russian, atta- a Russian tank mine actually surviving one of those on the front line, uh, Oleg Simoros. He now turned into a... A political activist and he tries to fight the corruption on the home front and there is this constant uh, need to fill the gaps in our midst and Ukrainians constantly you know <laughs> rise up rise up rise up to the challenge but what uh, I would not want to say uh, this to create a feeling or a sense that we are invincible or that we are these superheroes um, everyone is exhausted, as you can imagine, is exhausted mentally, physically, financially. So what I'd like to say is to encourage our listeners to support Ukraine in every possible way. Just don't look away from those fundraisers that help our defenders or our civilians. Um, yeah, and uh, try to just keep Ukraine in the focus of your attention because the struggle has not subsided. It's as fierce and as relentless as it's ever been. Sasha, I've got a quick question. That was a really great insight. Thank you very much. So you said you've been uh, back in Ukraine for a month, I think. When these attacks, an attack like a sustained attack rather, like this is happening uh, against Odessa, how do you operate? Do you go down there and, and check it out yourself? Do you go down there and take interviews? Do you, do you, do you record the, um, the violence that Russia's reaped on Odessa? And are you looking at the, um, the, the, the cultural and literary elements of, of it, or, or are you also looking at sort of the grain silos and, and the economic infrastructure? Uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's a very good question. There is a balance uh, that is to be found b- between, you know, actually being involved in documenting Russia's war crimes against Ukraine and becoming a kind of war tourist who is more of a liability on Ukrainian society than anything useful. So I'm trying to bear that in mind. Uh, and I, I hope, I don't know, that I'm uh, trying to contribute some... Um, lasting knowledge about Russia's war against Ukraine, which means uh, uh, not reacting to every single instance, uh, unless, you know, I happen to be in the epicenter of it, obviously, but rather to conduct this in-depth interviews with the participants and it doesn't happen, and it doesn't have to happen on the same day or in the same instant. Um, so I'm, I'm rather involved in creating, you know, this um, long-term record of what is happening in Ukraine. And can I ask a quick follow-up? We know that the cathedral in Odessa was operated by the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, the branch uh, linked to the, to, to the Moscow Patriarch. Can you anticipate how they will react? to this and whether they uh, this sort of uh, attack by Russia on, on one of its major cathedrals and whether they will give you access, free and fair access to the cathedrals and allow you to ask follow-up questions. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's quite ironic what um, and obviously a very dark moment for Ukrainian uh, Orthodox Church of the Russian Patriarchate from uh, what I've heard um speaking to people who are the believers and who attend uh, Kiev Pashersk Lavra, for example, who belongs to the same branch of uh, Russian Orthodoxy. 
uh, people do their best to compartmentalize their faith and the uh, policy and Russian involvement of their church as an institution. So they try to say that their faith is quite separate from uh, what the patriarchs of their church might be doing, and they try not to think about that at all. And I don't think that this is fruitful uh, for the congregation or basically for Ukraine in general, that this compartmentalization um, is used as an instrument, obviously. Um, this church has been uh, involved with Russia and is influenced by Russia and is one of the uh, instruments uh, of influence on Ukrainian society. Just to ask you um, a question, because I know you've been tweeting about it recently, about the use of language as a form of resistance, because it's one thing I've, I've picked up speaking to people on my trips, and they've obviously been staggered uh, by months to Ukraine, um, is the amount of people that now speak Ukrainian as their first choice language and not Russian, even as you sort of travel towards Kharkiv, where it would have been a predominantly Russian-speaking Area. And I'm just wondering on, on your thoughts on that. And, and, and are, there, are there anyone that you've picked up who are helping people who maybe um, were predominantly Russian speakers learn Ukrainian? And are there any kind of nice stories that you've kind of picked up on your kind of looking into, looking into this um, language as a form of resistance? I, I found it fascinating how the Ukrainian language has really grown uh, sort of over the last 18 months in that vein. It is indeed fascinating. I'm currently in Kiev, which used to be a bilingual city with, I would say, a Russian preference. Um, but now the soundscape in the capital has changed completely. So now it's uh, uh, more, more than ever a Ukrainian cap capital speaking Ukrainian language. Um, and it's uh, the language uh, we use in um, public services, in institutions, but also on the streets, like uh, Ukrainians have switched and it's become clear to everyone, it seems, or almost everyone, that the language of the aggressor is not something to um, continue using, you know, without, without consequences. Um, Russia has weaponized its language and Ukrainians are using the consequences right now. Uh, I would say that uh, this uh, has also prompted Ukrainians to look into their cultural identity uh, and to explore what has been maybe overshadowed by centuries of Russian colonialism. Uh, there is a boom in Ukrainian book publishing. Uh, in Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainians are opening independent bookshops like crazy in the capital right now. Uh, I think there has been uh, seven to eight new bookshops uh, that have uh, been open since the full-scale invasion. And what people working in these bookshops tell me is that the most popular uh, literature Ukrainians are looking for these days is actually Ukrainian classics or Ukrainian contemporary literature. So we are on this course to explore our roots to explore our literary history, to understand what has been distinguishing us from our imperial oppressors for a very long time, and what, it, what is it actually that allows us to persevere and to cultivate our culture, even under such drastic circumstances as we are facing today. Perhaps you could offer our listeners today some suggestions for some summer reads that have potentially been translated from Ukrainian into English over the years, because uh, I, I'm guessing a lot of our listeners would have sort of grown up um, with Soviet novelists, uh, Russian novelists and writers. But now, as you say, there's there's sort of a renaissance in Ukrainian writing. So I was wondering if you could, even if it's just, just for me, uh, suggest a, a book or two um, for our summer holidays. Of course. My favourite writer... Um, is Lesa Ukrainka, uh, a Ukrainian feminist and anti-colonial thinker, um, a forgotten feminist of, uh, of Europe, uh, if, you, um, if I may say so, uh, who has been this fantastic uh, reinventor of classical myths of the Western civilization. So she rewrote Don Juan, for example, from a female perspective, or the myth of Troy, uh, from the perspective of the Trojan prophetess Cassandra, 
Cassandra has been recently translated by Nina Mari, and it is av available from the um, Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute uh, publishing. So Lesia Ukrainka uh, is also published uh, in London Ukrainian Review. It's just a plug for the magazine that we publish with the Ukrainian Institute London. But this is uh, indeed the place where you can find excerpts and fresh translations of her poetry and prose. But apart from that, um, uh, the full-scale invasion has also stimulated the translation of Ukrainian poetry. There is a fantastic uh, website called Words uh, for War, if I'm not mistaken, which translates contemporary Ukrainian poets like Irina Shovalova and Katerina Kalitko and Serhii Zhadan. So I encourage everyone to check it out. Serhii Zhadan is, of course, a fantastic Ukrainian uh, writer, prose writer, poet, uh, songwriter, rock star, activist, volunteer, uh, the full-time citizen of Ukraine. And um, uh, he is also the author of the novel called The Orphanage, which describes Russia's invasion uh, from the long, long historically thrown back point of 2015. So this is a reminder that the war has been waged for almost a decade, and there are already literary texts that give us a reflection of, on this war. Just so Sergei Shadan is definitely, yes, someone to, to, look, to look into. Just very quickly for listeners, uh, we actually did interview Sergei Shadan and Sasha did our translation. That was a couple of months ago now, so um, do go back and listen to that. Joe, I know you had one more question. It is, I, I think it's an important one, given the amount of Ukrainians who left to Europe as refugees at the beginning of this full-scale invasion. But as things have now settled down and the focus has moved to sort of the south and the Donbass regions now, um, more and more people seem to be returning. So I was just wondering if you could share some personal thoughts on what it's like to return to Ukraine, Sasha. I, I, I know from being on the train from Szezemel in Poland into Kyiv. You see lots of people who are making that journey home and they're, they're, and they're all delighted. So I was wondering if you could sort of share what it's like to be back home after time away, because I, I, I can guess it's an amazing feeling, even if sort of this full-scale invasion is going on, there's still sort of attacks on Odessa, on Kyiv, on even Lviv at times. It's a, still um, a scary place to be at times, but it must be fantastic to be, be home. A wonderful question. Thank you. I can actually share a story of a woman I interviewed. Her name is Olga. Uh, I interviewed her uh, two weeks ago, and it was her fifth day back after spending um, a year and a half in Poland. So she was one of those who left and did not have an opportunity to come back even for a short while. She went with her two kids and uh, really struggled in Poland mentally and uh, in all sorts of ways, being away from home, being away from her family, being alone in a foreign country and so on and so forth. So she made this decision to come back with her kids to Kiev. And uh, she was literally, she looked high. She, she, she was so enthusiastic. She couldn't get enough of air, sounds, language, food, everything around her uh, was a constant delight. And I related to that feeling because this is exactly how I feel when I'm back in, in my home country. Um, I'm also thinking of the words that Alexandra Matvichuk, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize uh, laureate of this year, shared with me. She said that during her uh, first trips abroad since the full-scale invasion, uh, she felt that she was crazy. She lost her mind when she was abroad, when she was in peaceful European cities where people continue living their peaceful Norman lives. Um, having witnessed what she had witnessed in Ukraine as a human rights defender and an investigator of Russia's war crimes, she could not connect these two worlds. She felt that she imagined all the horrors she was speaking about to international audiences. And I think I can relate to this feeling as well when you're away from Ukraine and you try to... Um, somehow transfer this experience to make it relatable to international communities. 
uh, there comes a moment when you start doubting yourself because just uh, speaking about all the tragedy that Ukraine is facing these days um, is, is unimaginable in a context of, uh, of a peaceful European city. And being here, being back with your community, with your close people, with your friends, and sharing this historical moment with them actually <laughs> helps uh, to, to hold on to reality, I would say. Um, and yeah, and try to do your best here. Just to say to that, that question of returning home to sort of you said the familiar sounds, the foods and stuff, I, I, I guess when you're experiencing in your home country a, a conflict, a war, a full-scale invasion like this one, people do look for those tiny bits of normality, those the queuing outside restaurants, um, visiting your favorite your favorite bars and uh, that's that's something that you that you find all across Ukraine whether it be in I visited a craft beer bar in Odessa looking for supplies of sort of British beers to see if people were enjoying those to find a, a sort of a blossoming brewing industry in Ukraine and um, or whether it be people queuing outside their favorite restaurants looking uh, in the capital, it's, it's it's moments like that that I think um, they they can bring a smile to anyone's face, even in 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 the toughest of times. And so long may that continue. Um, that Ukrainians are allowed that sort of brief spell to enjoy life at home. Thank you very much, Joe James Kilner. So, David, as you know, I, my role is on the Moscow desk, so I'm predominantly looking at the Kremlin and Russia covering Ukraine as well and, and the frontline news when, when I need to. But predominantly my role is to try and understand what's uh, going on in Russia and and, and the Kremlin, Putin, Lukashenko, Prigozhin, Wagner, etc. So I will be continuing to look very closely at Wagner and Belarus. I think that's a very important and, and massive story that we need to keep looking looking out for. I think this uh, the arrival of these African leaders uh, towards the end of the week is going to be hugely important for the grain deal. 100% this is an attack on the grain deal, these the, these missile and drone attack uh, around Odessa and, and the Danube region. I'm also interested in, I, I spent quite a lot of time last week, a whole day cold calling hotels, bars, tour agents in, in occupied Crimea and talking to tourists about, uh, Russian tourists about what's going on down there. And um, they all sort of independently said roughly the same thing. Bookings are down by 50% in the north of the occupied region, but 10-ish, 10%-ish in, in Yalta and Sevastopol, the main tourist centres. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at how, and, and and this is despite the drone attacks, which we've seen, a, we have seen a massive increase in drone attacks on occupied Crimea in the last few weeks it was only a week ago the Kirsch Bridge got hit again, and uh, in the in the intervening week we've uh, seen multiple drone attacks on the on the Russian uh, Black Sea Navy in in Sevastopol and various ammunition dumps. It does seem that the Ukrainian messaging that they are going after Crimea is being ramped up. But I wrote sort of a semi tongue in cheek story about how. Russian tourists are being steadfast, although although some are leaving. Um, so I'm sort of continuing looking at those sort of little nuggets of information. They're very hard to draw out of Russia, and that took a lot of reporting. And I, I read today in Commerçant, uh, the Russian newspaper, obviously pro-Kremlin, as all uh, Russian media is these days, uh, they are reporting that Ozon, uh, sort of sometimes referred to as one of Russia's Amazons, sort of an online uh, internet shop. There's other ones like What Wild Berries as well. Uh, this is one of the original ones. Ozon has agreed to take on or has is, is, is had to employ 500 convicts from Russian prisons. It claims these are mid-level convicts and not sort of the rapists and the murderers uh, that have been sent to the front line, et cetera, but uh, nonetheless convicts. And they promise that they're not going to be doing the, 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 the delivery services. They're going to be working in the storehouses and packaging. And that really is a result of Russia's lack of manpower due to the war. Uh, and it's just another little indication of how Russia's society is changing and crumbling and cracking because of the war. The central bank put up interest rates by uh, 100 basis points, one percentage points last week for the first time since about September uh, last year as it tries to deal with inflation. And we know the Russian economy is really taking a big hit. 
despite the headline figures, the civilian economy is down hugely. So I'm looking at all those indicators and trying to pick through it and work out what's going on. Thank you very much, Joe and James. Uh, Sasha, thank you so much for joining us. As our guest, would you like the very final thoughts? I would just like to thank you for the excellent coverage and for keeping your eyes and ears on Ukraine uh, for so long. We really cherish your sustained support and uh, Slava Ukraini. Earlier this month, I spoke to Oksana Lebedeva, founder and CEO of non-governmental organization Gen Ukraine, which argues for the importance of children's mental health amidst the war. It aims to help Ukrainian children who have suffered trauma from the invasion. And you can learn more about the organization in the show notes. Here's our conversation. Thank you very much for your time today. And would you just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been doing in the last year and a half? My name is Oksana Lebedeva. I'm uh, before the war happened. I was an entrepreneur, and I'm still uh, is. But uh, since the war happened, I also founded the foundation, which aims to assist kids with a traumatic background. Can you set the scene for our listeners and talk about the impact of the war on Ukraine's children? Oh, I'm glad you ask that. I think it's obvious that the trauma of war will not bypass any child in Ukraine. Uh, World statistics say that 25% of the population will need to a certain extent or special psychological assistance. But these are very large numbers because Ukraine is a big country. And the topic of childhood war trauma has not been studied in the world at all. We have faced this when we started working on the very first shift of our intensive rehabilitation camp for children who lost their parents in the Russian-Ukrainian war. All the world's unknowledge protocols were not designed for the death of trauma that our children are experiencing now. Then, to understand the impact of which we do, it's crucial to have a closer look for children with who we're working now. You work with lots of different children from all over Ukraine. Are there any stories in particular from them that stand out to you that you'd want our listeners to know about? Oh, wow. I, you know, it's already more than 200 kids I work with. And um, there are many such stories. I'm no longer impressed by the evil that we all and especially children had to face. But I always say that I'm amazed by the good amazed by the strength of spirit with uh, which some of our children go through this pain. Then very memorable for me is the story of an uh, 11 years old girl from Odessa region, Anichka, whose mother and father left her in a corridor under the rubble wall and uh, went to take some stuff from the balcony, something like that, while the air alarm was going off. And both of them never returned. And, you know, she told me that every morning she forgets that they are not longer with her and calls for them and then remembers what happened and gets ready for school. Then every morning she loses them again and again. And also I was so impressed by a teenager from Bucha whose father was shot and wounded in front of him. A Russian soldier made a check shot in the head of 15 years old boy. But the bullet got stuck in the hood of his hoodie and uh, he survived. Then he even, could you imagine that he even identified the killer in the prosecutor's office uh, database and uh, was able to call him on his messenger. When you're working with these children, what challenges do you and your team face as psychotherapists? Mm -hmm. The main challenge was to create program exactly for our children. Because the experience of our foreign colleges didn't meet the reality and needs of our children. I believe it's the most important. Uh, the intensity of traumatic events and the fact that the war is still going on be- and become challenges too fast now. You've mentioned the camp. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Where, where did this idea to set up Gen Camp come from? And how, how did you design it in a way that you thought would help the children? 
you know, I, I still, uh, it was very personal for me because I still remember when the war happened, I found myself in USA and my kid was under bomb shelling in Ukraine. And it, it was four life changing days when I tried to get him. I remember every second and every minute of these days. Then uh, children, it's very personal for me. And um, also after I saw what happened to the occupied territory in Kyiv region, like Bucha, Irpin, I was deeply impressed. I got witness trauma, I would say. I understood that we will have to overcome all the consequences for many years and we must start right now. Right now or never, or it's going to be late. Then after I've got this trauma, I had my own psychotherapy. And next morning I woke, woke up with the idea to create this project. It's actually just the name, like summer camp. But it's a intensive, intensive rehabilitation. And uh, I, I believe, you know, it, it's just more easy to understand for parents, for kids, that the form which we give this intensive uh, rehabilitation, we call it uh, camp. Can we go into some detail? What happens on the summer camp? How do you help the children? Children have psychological therapy in group and individual form. Uh, 21 days of intensive treatment with a team of professional specialists. Uh, the program includes psychological and pedagogical part and is built in such a way that children can go through the process of uh, grieving in safe, supportive environment. As the result, we help them to connect past, present and future in, a, in one lifeline. Then the main idea of the program is integrate their traumatic experience to their biographical memory. In this way, we can connect their past, present and future. Fu to plan the future, it means recovering for kids' uh, psychic. Then um, we work with the various tools. We do that to make sure that we can reach out to different children in a different way. It's an art therapy. There are many group individual uh, anim animal therapy. It's a special treatment for, for night reading and uh, different, different tools. And after the camp is over, what's the help for these children going forwards? We keep in touch with children and their caregivers. They can always ask for help and receive it, and they do it. The program in includes a big part of educational lectures for caregivers, guardians, yes. <laughs> guardians and parents. It depends who's still alive and who is with a kid now. Then while children in a camp, they've got these educational lectures in order to provide supportive environment for children after they come back from camp. Because, you know, it's always you have to be back to home and uh, the war is still going on. How do you see your work has changed over the past year and a half? I mean, from what you said today, it sounds like you had to create quite a lot to do all this. So how has what you've done changed over the past year and a half? Oh, children has changed a lot, you know, because uh, some of them returned to us again and again because uh, last year they lost, for instance, mother and this year already father. We continue to enrich the program is the main idea. We create working books for children and for teenagers. We stopped on 21 days because first uh, camps was longer. Uh, now we can help 50 children at once because we started with uh, 30. And uh, our command grows and our aims grow also. Going forward, looking forward for you and your organization, what are your plans for the, for the coming year? Are you going to expand? Um, how are you going to do that? Of course, we're, we're going to continue, you know, we're not going to stop. And uh, we see such a cool result and uh, we achieve uh, even more than we expected. Then uh, we're going to continue and fight for our kids. We're going to get back uh, all our kids from this war. What do you think for your organization are the, um, like the biggest challenges that you face right now? If you, if you could wave a magic wand, what would you change or correct or add to? I would stop this war <laughs> if we are talking about magic. 
Is there anything about the program, about the people you help, that you'd want our listeners to understand that we haven't spoken about or I haven't asked? Oh, I would say thank you to all relatives uh, of these kids, uh, parents or guardians, whoever are with them now. I, I want to thank to them that they believe in their kids and continue support despite on the odds, uh, despite on the war. And uh, together we will win. And uh, it's very important, you know, we have a two fronts now. It's a front line. Uh, and also it's a psychological front because we try to defend their, um, you know, children, personal borders, like our army defend uh, our borders in the East. And do you have any, any message or thoughts for international listeners um, who are listening maybe from the UK, the rest of Europe or, or the US? Just, uh, I want to thank you, thank you all of you guys, because uh, I feel the support every day. And um, I would say that we are now on a verge uh, to bring up the best generation in our history, because these kids who saw so much, who felt so much, at this, and at the same time didn't break, they could be a great example of a greatness, hardness, and the most resilient people, not only in Ukraine, but all over the world, then we need your support. Now we just fight for future, fight for our kids. And I believe these kids can be future all over the world. Oksana, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, David. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just one pound at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. We'll sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1 p.m. London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Today's episode of Ukraine The Latest has been produced by Elliot Lampitt. The executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells. <laughs>